All right, I think we can start. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in to this edition in the series of Twist Talks at IST Austria. This time around, we are having a very special speaker again. But uh, before I tell you more about Jonas, uh, just let me give you a quick reminder why we are organizing Twist Talks. Um, one of um, the pillars of technology transfer at IST Austria is uh, to foster entrepreneurship um, and to illustrate that creating and running a startup can be a very worthwhile and satisfying undertaking. To do that, uh, we are inviting regularly former scientists uh, turned entrepreneurs and hope that you enjoy learning from their experience. Um, Again, back to our speaker today, um, Jonas Zeuner is uh, the co-CEO and co-founder of Vitra Lab, which is an ISDQ portfolio company, as some of you might know. Jonas obtained his PhD in physics um, at the Vienna Center for Quantum Science and Technology in 2018, and is the main author of the idea on which uh, Vitra Lab is based. His expertise in WebGuide sector has been validated during the last years, and he's worked with uh, a number of world-leading integrated optics groups uh, like MIT, CNR, and the University of Rostock, um, enabling the development of Vitria Labs idea. Um, he took part um, in the INITS um, startup camp of 2018 at the ISCT Summer School on Entrepreneurship in 2019. I myself had the pleasure briefly to work with Jonas, and I'm absolutely excited that we are having him here virtually today with us. Um, with that, I give the word to Jonas. Um, the floor is all yours. Thanks, Bernard. Hello, everybody. Um, so let me upload my slides. If you pull yours down, Bernard. Yes. One second. So is this now full screen for you? Perfect. All right, so um, when Ben had asked um, if to me to do this talk, I was uh, thinking what would be the best way of doing it. And uh, in the end, I decided to, to make kind of a talk that I would have found interesting being a PhD student, uh, potentially considering to create my own startup. And the most interesting way would have been for me if somebody did it already and was kind of telling the story of all how it all happened and then um, having a conversation on what could be fitting towards your experiences and what are the questions you are coming up with from, from hearing this story. And if this is also motivating you to, for example, do the same. So I'm gonna give a very quick intro towards uh, myself as persona then uh, how I came up, uh, how I came to Vienna, how I did my PhD, and then how it came about that I uh, created Vitra Lab and co-founded a startup. Okay, so I'm from Germany. Um, if you can't hear it by the accent, <laughs> I was born in Münster, which is Northwest Germany in a small town called Menden. And uh, I've always been um, uh, interested in doing engineering, physics, uh, generally science, reading up on these things and um, yeah, this was always my passion. And then also in the end, it was what became my profession. And I've always been a, a big risk taker, as you can see on the bottom right on this picture. So I always try to, to do things that are a bit more dangerous than, than other things. And I think this is also why in the end I said, it could be interesting to do something like a startup, which is also risky. Um, I, when thinking about this, I remember actually this. This is a just small uh, uh, slide on the side. It is a really nice book uh, in German, obviously uh, about optics. It's called Linsen Lupen Magische Scope, and this is a, as a teenager. This was actually the book that uh, shaped my interest into optics and uh, has been like defining this as one of my the big passions uh, of of me uh, about science since then and uh, kind of defined what I'm doing. So I'm just saying if you're at some point want to have a really nice illustrative book about optics in German. This is, I think, the, the go-to thing. It's not as detailed, of course, as any uh, like physics book, but it's, it's really, really nice read. 
All right. So um, then coming back to the main thing, uh, I studied uh, after finishing high school, I studied physics in Heidelberg. Uh, it's a beautiful city with a huge physics faculty. And uh, during this time, I, I kept my, my interest in optics al alive, even though I, of course, I had to do a lot of other things. Did my bachelor even in environmental physics, but then for my master thesis, I came back to, to optics and I, I did uh, a master thesis um, in uh, for cold atoms, cold atoms. So where you need a lot of lasers to, to control, of course, all these trapping of the optics, uh, optics uh, of the atoms in uh, both the and condensate. And during this time, also because my supervisor was actually from, from Austria, I, I did a more or less accidental trip to a summer school in Vienna, uh, the Coco Summer School at the time. And I realized that um, even though Vienna was not at all on my radar at the time, that Vienna is actually a huge scientific powerhouse and in, special, in particular in quantum science. At the time, I think had the, the most researchers doing quantum physics in the entirety of Europe. And then I, I had the idea of uh, it could be interesting to do something with quantum and optics as a PhD. So there was a very rough idea and therefore this could be interesting. And uh, that's also what I went for. And during this, I mean, other things I did is um, I always had an interest in economics, um, uh, in theater playing also in, in sports. I think in particular economics interested, for example, is, is helpful if you want to create a startup later on. I mean, you don't have to have it, but it certainly helps you if you at least um, are motivated to understand how economics work, how, how a company works, how these things work. And theater, I mean, can be helpful because in the end, every pitch that you do is a, is a little theater play <laughs> and you will pitch a lot. So if, if you have a little bit of an idea how, how you can shape this, um, these presentations and in, in create it more like a theater pitch, I think that's helpful. All right, so after my time in Heidelberg, I then went to, to, to Vienna, as I said, and I decided to make a PhD in pure, pure optics, pure photonics, no more uh, cold atoms, which are extremely tricky to deal with, as some of you might know from personal experience. And I had um, this, as I said, combined interest in quantum computation and, and optics. And there was one group in Vienna and also in all, all Europe that really was dedicated to exactly this. So pure photonic uh, quantum computation. And that was the Walter Group, the University of Vienna, a fairly new group at the time. And uh, I joined as I think the seventh or eighth uh, PhD student. I didn't really have much of an idea what I was uh, gonna do. But um, I was put on a project which was focused on integrated photonics uh, with S in terms of X. <laughs> but um, so integrated photonics is um, something I had actually no idea even existed. or oh, I had also no idea what it is. And what it is, is shown here on the right as a render image. So you have, you have a chip in this, in this sense, uh, in, in this render, a glass chip into which you inscribe uh, small light guides, so small light channels. And you can make the enter then photons, for example, here on the left, and they will propagate through the entire chip, they will interfere. And this allows you to do quantum computations. So this is what I used during my PhD. So I had a, a huge setup where one part of it was um, generating single photon states, then had this, this chip, sending light in, getting light out. And then of course, doing measurements on, on what we produced. And um, this particular chip was fabricated actually not here in Vienna. I was just using it. it the chips were coming from, at the time, from um, CNA in Milano and uh, from a group in Jena later in Rostock, and also even, even later chip from MIT. But the chips um, from Italy and Germany, they were done in this, in this fashion here. And uh, so what you have here is a fabrication method for integrated photonics. So with it, oops. So with this thing here on the left, you produce the chip on the right. You take a piece of glass, you move a, a laser over it, and the laser locally melts the material and, and creates this kind of light channels. So it's a pretty cool technology. Um, as, as I said, I mean, um, I was only focused on using these chips on the right. I was never involved in the fabrication itself in any uh, detail. I was just involved in like how they should be set up, what's the circuit that should be implemented in them, but uh, and on the general characteristics, but I had not done any fabrication. And I emphasize this because what we're actually doing at Vitrial Lab is fabrication. <laughs> so 
just, I mean, I, I want to say if there's, for example, something you have a lot of like um, indirect knowledge about, it might still be worthwhile um, creating a startup out of it because most of the details can be learned if you're close enough to what's actually happening. So even though I've never entered a fabrication lab, I have then founded a, a lab for fabricating um, these waveguides. Then uh, the idea, idea for Vitra Lab came up actually after three years, roughly in my PhD, I went um, to Innsbruck to one of the, the meetings, the, the quantum teams always said there, it's a very long train ride. And I was always pondering what could we do with this technology apart from quantum physics, there's very likely something um, even more uh, short term in terms of using this amazing technology than uh, something that might work in 20, 30 years. And while I was looking out of the window, I thought actually, if we could implement waveguides in this train window, we could probably uh, implement a, a display in, in this train window. I mean, why not? It would be a cool thing to do. You don't see the waveguides implemented in the glass by eye. And then you should, could show any kind of information. You could just show what's the time, what's like the distance to the next train stop and so forth. Then back in Vienna, I sat down, I spent some more time thinking about this, how it would actually have to look and how you could create such a transparent display. Started writing uh, a technical paper. So here you see on the right, a figure out of this. And of course the idea, once you have an idea, it easily is to expand it, right? So it was in the end, not just a transparent idea, display also you can make a volumetric display holographic display out of this technology um, you could make a touch recognition all kinds of things so i i, I created a paper writing this all up having a, a rough idea how these things could work together but it, of course it was purely theoretical so there was no exp experiments at the time going in that direction so i mean in the lab i was still doing this um, rather um, simplistic chips um, with like a few waveguides, five to ten. Um, so we we didn't really go into making this these structures, which were which are um, need hundreds of thousands or millions of waveguides. Still, um, it was interesting enough uh, for my supervisor at the time, and also for the technology transfer office of the university that they said, sure, we can take this up and make a patent out of it. And I thought, yeah, sure, great. Um, let's make a patent. Um, after writing a technical paper, it's actually fairly straightforward. So then you start talking to a patent lawyer and uh, they will start drafting the document. After a few discussions, you, you will file this, this, uh, this patent. A few uh, comments on patents for PhDs. Of course, there's uh, a lot of info you can get at IST from this, from the technology transfer office, or also from uh, IST Cube. We have a lot of expertise. But just one, some things that I um, think are particularly interesting. So first of all, if you have make an invention at work, um, you are not the owner of that um, IP, of that patent, but your employer is. But uh, at the, in Austria, at least, you get, um, by law, you get financially compensated for that in most cases. I mean, not necessarily, but that's the idea at the uni, for example. They, phrase it like this. If you then want to make a pattern, as I said, you have to, to write up uh, some kind of technical description, makes it much easier for the lawyer to, to understand things. And you will only get a good, a good patent if the lawyer actually understands what you're trying to patent. So it's also important uh, to have a good lawyer in, in this sense. And yeah, I mean, it takes a long time to um, from filing a patent to actually getting it granted. And by granted, I'm meaning that by then you have the, the legal ability to go after people. So, I mean, you have them really like, the, you have statements right written down, for example, this and this is essentially my invent, invention. If somebody does this particular thing, he should pay me a license fee or I can sue him. So it will take quite a long time actually to get that, that running. And uh, VTLAB actually still does not have a granted patent. Um, we have um, now six um, pending patents, but it's it's still ongoing, and uh, it will take some time to to settle. But of course, this um, is not inhibiting you of um, making a startup out of um, a pending patent, right? I mean, if you did uh, a good background check um, and you also get a search report from the European Union after half a year after filing, 
you can get a, a fairly decent assessment of how strong your patterns gonna be. You, you get some idea. So this is typically enough for funding agencies and investors to say, yeah, we, we can finance uh, an endeavor based on that. And for um, deep tech startups, patterns are extremely important. So um, it's of course very, if you want to make, um, if you want to make a startup out of your PhD, um, since you're associated or even working at IST, very likely it's going to be a deep tech startup. And I think then it's essentially mandatory to have some kind of patent because nobody wants to finance you developing something really cool and complex. And uh, after they, you spend millions doing that, somebody else can come and copy that. So you need some kind of patents. I know I, one, one more thing, by the way, of course, then if you make a startup, you will have to license this patent out of the entity you work for. So in our case, it was the University of Vienna. Um, and before that happens, it will be also very tricky for you to get any funding. But in luckily for us, I mean, the University of Vienna at least was um, very accommodating to us in that sense that they, they gave us a fair deal. There are other universities, uh, in particular in the US or Britain, which make extremely tough um, financial deals for startups. But in our case, it was something that uh, did not uh, in any way prohibit founding a startup. Anyway, um, so after around four years, um, I finished my PhD and was trying to figure out what to do next. And uh, as you are probably in a similar position at some point, it will be in the next years, I was considering, should I do a postdoc continue the academic path. I could just go into the uh, private sector. And my, um, uh, my idea was to do data science. I even did a, a boot camp in London right after finishing. And pretty low on the list at the time was actually uh, becoming an entrepreneur. Um, was not the, the top thing. But then I was talking to a friend um, who knew about all these uh, transfer and display idea and that it could be a worthwhile thing to do. And he told me that uh, in particular in Austria, you actually can get um, quite a significant amount of uh, funding from uh, public sector uh, to create deep tech startups. Because they know that uh, at institutions, um, a lot of knowledge is produced and uh, which also could be um, very worthwhile to spin off into private companies, but it's often not done. Because uh, as a PhD student, I mean, you don't have any money and any experience. So it would be impossible for you to just get a startup running with, with your own money. So this is important to know. And then I started investigating and thinking about, should I actually make a startup? If um, I can get this kind of grants, would it be worthwhile to me? And this is um, a bit of my, my thinking process, um, what I consider the, the pros and the cons of making a startup. Um, of course, it's extremely nice that you can work on something you really believe in, something you think is a very cool technology, very new, um, something you would quite likely not be working on if you just go to, to some job in the industry. It's also ex incredibly challenging, obviously, um, to do something you would be out of your comfort zone most of the time, but you also learn a lot, right? So I, I think I've never learned as much in my life as in the first year of um, running this startup because you have, you're new in everything, right? Apart from the small scientific thing that you worked on during a PhD, I mean, all these private sector stuff, uh, running a company, hiring a team, uh, getting operations going, uh, talking to customers, uh, finding finding uh, money from uh, investors, all this stuff is completely new. So you learn a lot, which I think is really nice. And of course, there's a perspective that you're going to be rich soon, <laughs> which is, of course, a nice motivation. You, you think, OK, fine, uh, I make this startup and in two years I'm going to sell it to Apple, going to be rich, don't have to work anymore. But of course, <laughs> This is uh, something you should be very well aware of. It's uh, quite unlikely to happen. But of course, it's, it's still a nice motivation on this side. Um, on the country side, I mean, it's uh, the high level of responsibility. And of course, being out of your comfort zone will be uh, very stressful if, if you are continuously having to, to fight to understand things. And this was for me the, the main thing that's um, was I was thought about it a lot. Do I actually want to deal with this kind of uh, stress level over, over some years? Um, is, it, is it really worth it? And uh, something actually I was not also aware of um, is also something to consider. It's that if you're successful, you're doing uh, something which is a, a long-term commitment. 
because as a founder, I mean, now Video Lab is now a company with nine people. It um, would be very weird for me to say, okay, bye guys, actually, I don't want to do this anymore. I go somewhere else. I move to the US or whatever. Um, it, it's something you are very unlikely to do, right? Because then it might be that the entire company crashes and it's not something easy. So, I mean, if you want to be very flexible, it's of course also not easy to create a startup as long as you're not fully flexible and you can move around the globe. But the key takeaway in the end was, um, I thought, fine, if I can make things in a way that they're fun, um, it can't be too bad. Um, so I, I just have to find the right environment and then it could be an interesting journey and hopefully uh, the cons, uh, the pros gonna outweigh the cons. And then I made an another list of <laughs> some do's and don'ts. I, I came up with uh, today um, what, I, what I think is also important to know when you do a startup. Um, one of the important ones is uh, I would really avoid to, um, any financial commitments or problems um, which go beyond what you could easily, let's say, write off. Because, I mean, uh, if you finish a PhD or even if you finish a postdoc, you're unlikely to have any significant financial resources. If you go into debt, for example, to finance this, I think it's a very bad idea because, I mean, it's already stressful enough on its own. And then if you think if this goes bankrupt, they're going to be in debt for 100,000 euros or something. It's not a perspective I would like to have. Uh, it's, I think it's unnecessary. In particular, if, there, if you cannot get any grants or investments for pushing your startup ahead, it's probably in the end not such a good idea in any case. Then um, don't do it alone. Um, so you have to find somebody that you can, can fully trust because um, if you do such a thing, um, it's very likely that you're the only one or you and your co-founder are the only ones that truly believe that this can be done. That it's a good idea. And um, everybody else will be, of course, constantly doubting you. You will grant agencies, investors. I mean, the natural perspective is, of course, to say, um, trying to figure out why what, what you're trying to do will not work. <laughs> and, and what about, uh, what about is, uh, is, is not never going to work and why it's a bad idea? So it's, of course, a constant grind um, that you're going to experience um, and which you have to survive, of course. And if you just you are alone, um, always had, trying to have this motivation that this what you're doing is amazing. I think it's tough. You have to be a very strong believer. But if you at least have one co-founder, I think it's much easier because then you, you have this perspective. I mean, you, you don't start thinking you're insane. At least, there's, or at least there's another insane person with you, which uh, is then very helpful. <laughs> on the contrary, I mean, also don't do it with too many people. Um, so actually in the beginning, we were not two, we were three. Um, and then the third person dropped out just before we actually founded the company because of he, he was still in the PhD and didn't fit in into his, um, into his plans. And so I know a bit of like um, working with, um, with a team of three and a team of two. And I think a team of two is actually ideal because for a decision-making purpose, this is just so straightforward, right? I mean, you can just call somebody and you have a face-to-face -face meeting and you just nail it down and you can get decisions running uh, and move forward very quickly. With three, it's already harder because uh, maybe you have to, to find a common time and everything just gets a lot less flexible. I mean, it's, th it's still worthwhile. I think it can still work, but I think two is, is better. And anything more than three, um, I think is extremely hard. I mean, I, I've seen other startups that had five or something founders. And I think at that point, it's extremely tricky. I mean, only if you have a very well-established way of making decisions that one or two persons then in this founder team are the ones making your decisions, I think you're bound to be not operating very well. Then, as I said, I mean, don't do it for the money um, because most likely there won't be any money. Um, but it, um, if you make it um, during this entire startup, uh, in, in, with a team in a workplace where you can be happy and you're having a good time. This, this is, I think, what you should be aiming for because you should always be able to think, okay, fine, we're going to close this company, but at least I, I had a good time, right? I learned a lot. Uh, it was an interesting experience. We pushed, we pushed things forward. We almost succeeded, but in the end we failed. It's fine. I mean, but if you, look, if you just do it for the money, in my perspective, it's like doing a PhD just for the title. And you're gonna have uh, a miserable time, uh, and potentially you will fail <laughs> even with your PhD. 
And then, I mean, what do you have, right? You have nothing. You just wasted some years of your life um, being miserable. So I think that's definitely not what you should be doing. Okay, I, this is I, I wanted to mention. Um, so I took part in this IECT uh, summer school from Hermann Hauser. Um, it's once a year uh, in, in summer. I think it's uh, actually a really great place to start if you want to do, if you're just thinking about creating a startup. So um, you spend a week there. There are people from all over Europe, um, other startups, other people that want to do something, investors. Uh, coaches, um, it's it's a great atmosphere, and I think you you learn a lot in this this one week, and um, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a really good idea to go there. Just to give you an idea, what's necessary to get a startup running, because also when I was thinking about it, I actually had no clue what this would imply. So of course you have to create some kind of legal entity, um, a GmbH. It's it's in Austria. So so something um, a legal body where you can um, which can license the patents, which will later employ you. Where investors could in money. This this is uh, what, what the legal entity means. And starting one is actually very straightforward. All you need is a few thousand euros, which you can get get for example from grants, and. You find a lawyer. Uh, we have very good experience with these guys. They will draft the documentation and you get a nota. And then you, you it's done in, in a few weeks. It's a straightforward process. For GmbH, then you also need a, an accountant, which does all your invoices, payrolling, and bookkeeping it will cost you another few thousand a year, depending, of course, what you do. But essentially, then you already have um, everything that's necessary to have uh, a startup. Formally, then that's that's done. Of course, then getting operations running is, is another thing that depending then highly on what you do. Um, for example, in our case, in men's rent lab space at the university, uh, hire people. Um, of course, you, it's very helpful if you already know some talented people uh, that work on this and that would be interesting to join the team. And of course, also getting licenses for patents and everything that's necessary to actually make this um, a working uh, company. So here's, here's a bit of text. It's just for me also to remember, because I wanted to give you a quick overview of um, how the, the first, let's say, one and a half years of Vitrilab went. Um, I can also describe this uh, later in more detail if people are interested. Um, but I think everything went, is able to go fairly quickly. So in, in May 2018, um, essentially, we assembled the team. Um, the next month already, we were in chats with one of the main Austrian funding agencies, which are very open to discuss this idea with us. Um, they said, talk to customers, figure out if this makes sense to us, uh, to you, then come back to us, which we then did in the next two months. And then already in September, we received our first grant of 180,000, um, which was then enabling us um, to, to do all these kind of legal operations that I just described, so setting up a company. So essentially, within like a few months, um, this entire thing went from being an idea to being an actual operating company, which I think is quite impressive, considering that uh, public grants are involved. And then immediately also, we applied for other grants. Um, FFG is the, the other main uh, big uh, in, uh, entity in Austria that um, can finance you. And we also took part in the in its boot camp. And it is an incubator of the University of Vienna and Technical University. Then in January, we started our full operations um, with lab space uh, rented uh, both in Italy and uh, in Vienna uh, with uh, three people, got our next grant um, and already started then in May our discussion um, with, for example, ISD Cube for our first funding round. And then uh, in July, we got an ERC grant another EIC grant and from then on moved on. So I think it, it went fairly quickly um, and I would have not thought that it can be done this kind of time uh, without uh, as when I was a PhD student. Um, something I also wanted to mention is um, 
when you create this kind of startup and you're going to talk of course to a lot of people to figure out if what you want to do does really make sense uh, it's very likely that you will at least dis um, discover that some details should be changed and adopted and you should be very open-minded about this and in our case this meant for example that we went um, from this transparent display idea more or less accidentally towards uh, creating backlights for lcds so lcds is the, the screen that you very likely have now in front of you um, it, which is just um, as a backlight behind is this rectangular uh, white light emitted by LEDs and then you have your modulators in front and we figured out that um, they actually have a huge energy efficiency problem these LCDs and then we can use our technology to make it substantially better and yeah so this is essentially we, we, I stumbled across uh, when talking to another guy at the Init's um, incubator that was also working on something related to displays and I, I had no idea that this problem existed and then suddenly we made this kind of small shift of uh, tailoring the kind of same technology and same approach, but I think it made a significant impact on the business model. Also keep um, keep innovating in the sense, so I mean, later on, I mean, we just, as I said, we find our six patterns. Uh, we always try to figure out what's actually our biggest competitive advantage. Um, we moved now also towards 3D displays, for example, building on what we are already doing. So I think it's very important to, to keep keep always aware of what you're actually doing and maybe something else is even, even better and easier or more compelling product than what you're actually working on. Uh, this slide is just uh, to give you an overview about funding agencies. Um, so as I say, AWS um, is, I think, where the place you should start. Um, you, so you can get the pre-seed grant later on the seed grant, which is significantly larger. And I would recommend starting there because um, they were very helpful also in just, uh, for example, I called somebody and a few days later, somebody came to the lab and we, we chatted for quite a long time, a very smart guy. And um, it helped shape us, also shape, helped shape the idea of creating a startup and what should actually be done. And uh, even told that which lawyer would be good and a lot of details. So I think it's a great place to start. And also when you have a compelling idea for deep tech startup, it's very likely that you get the pre-seed grant because this is really what they're trying to support. FFG is a, is a bit harder because um, uh, it's still, it's, it's fine to get the money from them, but they're less approachable, which um, if you're a young startup, you have actually no idea how to write this kind of grants and all the, the details, the booking and so forth, makes it a lot harder. Um, but also I think they're, um, ISD Cube, for example, or the technology transfer office could get you quite a bit of help. And then, of course, the, the final one, the final big one is the EU, um, the EIC or ERC in this case. Um, they're, of course, very competitive, these grants. Um, but if you win them, um, it's, of course, very helpful. And just here, um, as an example, these are the grants uh, we won with the years. So we started, as I said, with pre-seed. Then um, with FFG, um, some smaller European grants, and then now another bigger FFG program uh, that we won last year. And now we filed again for an EIC grant, and we will also file for another FFG grant. And uh, this brings me to the other side of the, the money equation is, of course, investments, um, for example, from venture capitalists or, or business angels. Business angels are just... Um, um, rich persons, let's say, that invest as a private person, whereas venture capitalists is uh, typically a fund, um, like so, so many, many millions, which is managed by, by a team that distribute the money. Uh, for example, ISD Cube is a venture capital firm. And as you probably know, what happens is you exchange some percentage of your startup against them putting money into it. Um, and I, Typically, if you find an investor, it should also be that they um, not just help you with, uh, with the funding, but they're also very helpful in shaping how your startup operates and that provide advice and uh, connect you to other investors and so forth. And I think also that they're very important for validating your idea, because if, if a venture capitalist invests in your startups, it at least um, means also to people that don't know you at all that what you're doing is, seems at least a, a reasonable endeavor. <laughs> and that there's the potential that this will work out well. 
And this is, of course, also be, again very impactful on funding agencies because um, if um, a grant agency sees there is um, private money invested, then they're much more likely to give the grant. And actually, also then the other way around. So if you then have a grant, you also get easier private money. So it's if you manage to get uh, both sides to to work with each other, then it's it's um, makes the most sense. And in Vienna, you have ISD Cube and Apex Ventures, which are both invested in us. And I think they're both really great investment firms um, um, can help you advise and brainstorm um, what you want to do. Uh, just to tell you where we are now, so um, Vichy Lab has now outgrown the uni. We are based uh, in our own facilities at the Tech Park in Vienna. And uh, yesterday, actually, that's a photo in the middle. We celebrated our third birthday. Um, as I say, we're now nine people. We have own lab space. Um, of course, if somebody's interested, they can drop by for a visit. I show you around. And with this, I'm at the end. If you have any further questions, I mean, we can discuss them now. But of course, I'm also happy to help. If somebody wants very specific advice, just get in touch with me via email and we can set up a meeting. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jonas. Um, many of the learnings that you that you presented resonated very well with me. Um, for the people at IST, I want to mention there is even one more source of funding very early on. As you might know, there is something like an IST twist fellowship, um, which means that if you have an idea as a scientist at IST, uh, you can get this funding for around a year. To, to work on that idea and find out if you really want to make that um, into a startup and um, or if you don't want to take it on. So that's a very nice addition to the to the funding overview that you gave. And for the QA, I would ask you, um, everyone can voice their questions. Um, I just would ask you to raise your hand before so that I can call you out and and we are not getting confused. Um, and while you're thinking about your questions, um, let me ask you, Jonas, um, so many of the people in the room might think uh, or might have the question, uh, are, you, are you growing at the moment? Are you opening any job positions uh, anytime soon? And what kind of positions would that be? <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, our next growth phase will start um around uh, May, June next year. So we will actually expand our laboratory space. Um, so we want to double our clean room area. And for this, we will be then looking for um, additional researchers, um, preferable with optics background, um, but doesn't have to be. We are only looking for people that are interested in doing things that are smart and uh, pick up things quickly. And then, yeah, we'll, we'll send around anyways via you, your uh, newsletter, probably then the positions <laughs> once they open up. Yes, so there is no shortage of smart people at IST. <laughs> I can guarantee you that. And of course, we will uh, feature any job uh, openings at Vitria Lab in the campus updates that is sent around um, IST, IST every second week. Um, okay, so my question to the audience, is there anyone with a question? Otherwise, I would like to ask you Maybe the first one. So, uh, retrospectively on your on your journey up to now, um, I know startups is all about you know making mistakes and learning from the mistakes. But is there really something that you feel you, you made a really big mistake and you wouldn't do that again? And there is a general learning that you that you have extracted from that. Um, um I'm not. I don't think we. We made any really big mistakes, but sometimes what I wonder, I think would have been really nice if we could have kept at the uni for longer. Um, because this, of course, uh, makes if, if you, I mean, we're still three years on, we're still making a, like work on proof of concept devices. And of course, it's if you can push your technology your idea further towards uh, having a proof of concept before you spin it off. I think that's actually very helpful. Of course, it makes it not easier to make a license negotiation with your with your entity, with the university, because once they realize, of course, it's actually working, it's going to be tougher than uh, if it's just at the idea phase. But this uh, is something I would definitely recommend to do. And there's, for example, also this FFG uh, spin-off fellowship, I think, which is also something that could be interesting. 
but it really depends um, on the situation because for, for us it would have been we considered that but it would have been extremely tricky because uh, we were working with the um, Italian university a lot and then how do you pay for example somebody in Italy from an FKFK spin-off fellowship so this turns out to be impossible and then we had to go for the GmbH right away yeah mm. okay Sebastiano um, has a question Sebastiano Hi, <clears throat> thank you very much for your talk. Um, so you mentioned public grants that uh, you got with for, for your, your idea and your startup. Um, the, uh, were there also public one, uh, public private ones? Uh, and if, if no, how come was that a choice or was it uh, just because you're, um, yeah. You, you mean um, private grants or investments? For private investments, sorry. I, so, I mean, we had some, so we have private investments um, from uh, ISTQ, for example. So they invested together with this other venture firm in, in Vienna after okay. roughly half a year after we were operational. And this is very helpful, um, first of all, because I mean, as I said, it's a, it's, a, it's a nice validation. It's your first step in getting private capital. So I think um, this is really worth doing. Even if, even if you would not need the money right away, I think it's extremely important to have this already like uh, in, your, in your company. And of, also in grants, you will find it very, very tricky to have some extra money to be to do the things that your operational need to do, but were very hard to find formally in a grant. And also in terms of cash flow, for example, the grant might pay you 50% of the grant upfront and then another percentage, but then the, the rest of the money only comes months after you, you finish the project or whatever. So it can be that then, I mean, suddenly you don't have any money on the account anymore to pay people. Um, and this puts you in a very bad position. And there, for example, it's very helpful to have some private money because it will just give you, for example, I don't know, 200,000 euro as an investment. And this, I mean, you can, can then, of course, use much more flexible than a grant because for a grant, you have to, every invoice, every payment you're doing, you will have to file with that grant agency. If an investor gives you money, he's just trusting you. Of course, he's also going to check roughly what you're doing, but essentially he's trusting you to spend that money wisely. And this is very important. I see. Thank you. And maybe, maybe a follow-up uh, question, uh, different though, is um, who are your clients? Who do you sell your technology to? So um, our main uh, business model is um, is licensing of the intellectual property. So we are a process designer and product designer. And um, the customers um, which we, um, we're talking to are in Asia, this is display manufacturers. So th this would be, for example, um, LG or um, Samsung, these kind of companies. All right, so we have another question from Thomas. Thomas, please. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk also. Um, I have two questions, basically. So the first one is more technology related. So I don't want to steal your IP or anything, but <laughs> what's the kind of fundamental thing? How do you burn those waveguides into the glass? Is it just uh, the beam waste where the electric field is so high? Um, to burn it into there, or is there another technology? And my second question would be, maybe I missed it, but how exactly do, did you do the transition from the university owning the patent to you making a startup out of it? How, again, was the like, how much does the university own then? Mm. Uh, okay, so uh, regarding your first question, so... Um... Is it essentially how are you thinking it is? So if you just focus the laser beam very tightly, and at some point the electronic field, um, electromagnetic field gets so strong that you essentially rip off, for example, the electrons of your uh, atoms in the glass, and then this absorbs all the heat at this focal point of your laser beam. So it's a pulsed laser, so you have a very very strong impact of energy, and then you kind of locally slightly melt the glass. So we make a refractive index change which is on the order of ten to the minus four. So it's tiny. It's enough to guide the light. Um, then regarding your second question, um, so we just uh, started uh, the negotiation with the, with the uni. We said, we want to license this patent from you and we also want to be able to buy it out. So I think, by the way, also very important to try to put buyout clauses into these um, license deals because at some point you're gonna be rich enough as a starter, you just want to buy the patent. You don't wanna have all the trouble you're gonna have with the university 
supply licensing this to you and you sub licensing this to somebody else this can get very complex um so you won't also have this buyout option and one thing and by the way i forgot to, to mention is um also when you when you found a startup you're extremely scared that um somebody's going to copy your idea because you have you have this brilliant insight and uh, i mean it's you know, like probably takes two months somebody just to copy it into, it's in my opinion at least for us it's completely untrue i mean it's incredible incredible hard to make something actually work in practice um and there's so many details you will not be considering in turning an idea into a product it, it's very unlikely that somebody just will say look i will now at samsung for example invest millions into doing this super hard thing where we actually not expert is in this guy's expert uh, just to to copy this guy before he even has proven that it works so I think another thing is to be aware that you can quite openly talk about your idea and trying to get feedback with, about, uh, for it without somebody necessarily trying to copy it right away. Of course, not before you file the patent, <laughs> but afterwards. Okay, cool. Thanks. One thing I want to, to add to the uh, question around what, what's the share of the university. IST has very open rules regarding that, and we just um, released uh, the spin-out policy. So you can have a look at the internet, uh, download the spin-out spin -out policy, and have a look what exactly are the conditions for startups here. OK, so we have another question. Daniel, please. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for, for this talk. It was very interesting, very nice. Um, I have a question about the this um, startup scene in, in, in Vienna. So, uh, of course, when you're doing business internationally, um, communication is like, you know, standard international business English. But um, how easy is it to deal with um, FFG and, and AWS um, if you are not a native German speaker? Mm, yeah, good point. I, I would actually say that it, it's fine. Um, of course, you will have some trouble, but also um, I think even more with the um, accountants and uh, mm -hmm. other like uh, government sites, I think this is even trickier. For, so my co-founder is actually Italian. Um, she does speak uh, German, but of course not necessarily on the level required for this. So I handle most of this stuff. Um, my experience would say that um, at least AWS, um, English is absolutely no issue. Um, no, no problem at all. Um, with FFG, um, it's a bit more mixed. So they definitely prefer German, but I mean, we write all our grant applications and reports in English and that's no issue. So I think also there, I mean, you will have maybe minor issues. Do you see other um, startupers, um, like the company funders um, who, are, who, are, um, who don't have the, the uh, advantage that of, of yours of uh, being a native speaker? Uh, good point. So, I mean, I, I don't think I know a Viennese um, startup which only has non-native speakers. No. Yeah, thanks. All right, so I think uh, that's it from the question side. So um, let me thank you very much for your presentation and for the quest for answering the questions, Jonas. Uh, it's been very insightful and very valuable to all hear all your learnings. And I hope we have kind of transported the spark to IST community and we will see great spin-outs and startups coming from IST in the future. All right, thank you. <laughs>